Hello, students. My name is Drew Donahue, pronoun she, hers, and I'm a Confluence AmeriCorps member with the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. Today, we are going to talk about beavers. First, I will go over the kind of beavers that live on Johnson Creek. Then I will describe what an ecosystem engineer is. After that, I will describe how beavers affect the land positively and negatively. Then I will describe what is negatively affecting beavers along Johnson Creek. Next, I will show the different beaver signs we look at in a survey, and then I will take you to a specific reach of Johnson Creek where I will show you how to do a beaver survey. Lastly, we will discuss what we found and then what can be done to encourage beaver activity along Johnson Creek. Before we dive into the specifics of beavers, I would also like to talk about the watershed's original stewards, also known as the First Peoples. This watershed was home to the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Cathalamet, Clackamas, Bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes. Portland, Oregon currently has the ninth largest urban Native American population in the U.S., with over 380 federally recognized tribes represented in the urban Portland metropolitan area. Native Oregonians continue to be active land stewards and community members. Wisdom of the Elders is a great nonprofit that works with us and does great restoration work on Johnson Creek. The American Beaver, the largest rodent in North America, commonly weighs in excess of 55 pounds. The beaver is highly modified for aquatic life with a compact body, paddle-shaped tail, webbed hind feet, valves that close their ears and nose while diving, and a rich oil gland that waterproofs their fur. Underwater, they have membranes that cover their eyes. In Oregon, the beaver occurs in suitable habitats throughout the state. It is almost always associated with riparian habitats bordered by a zone of trees. Beavers are most active in the evening or at night they can sometimes be observed engaging in various activities at any hour. In the early 1500s, the fur trade nearly wiped out the beaver to extinction. Beavers are actually not evolved to be active at night, but in urban areas, this is almost always the case due to human activity. So beavers are most famously known for their dams they build and are considered ecosystem engineers. Because beavers significantly modify the landscape through dams, they can flood an entire area and change how the current of the river is flowing. They directly affect numerous species by changing the landscape itself. They can either cause species to leave the area or can increase the amount of species that live there, and this is why they are considered ecosystem engineers. Ecosystem engineering is the creation, modification, and maintenance of habitats and microhabitats by organisms. A lot of organisms directly affect the landscape, but the term eco-engineer is often used only with keystone species. These are species on which other species in an ecosystem largely depend such that if they were moved from the ecosystem, it would change drastically. Some other examples of ecosystem engineers include Indian crested porcupines, which dig for their food, which is roots and tubers in the ground, and so it creates a soil pit that persists for decades. There's also shelter building caterpillars, which construct leaf shelters, such as leaf rolls, ties, folds, and tents. And these new microhabitats are used concurrently and subsequently by many other arthropods. Lastly, there's also harvester ants, who build mounds to house their colonies. In most cases, the incident and abundance of plant species is higher on these harvester ant nest mounds than on adjacent undisturbed soil. So what do these dams do? How do they change the landscape? These dams modify the peak flows, either lowering them or increasing them. They store flood water, decrease velocity by slowing the water. They trap fine sediment. They create wetlands, which is pretty significant because they can create a whole habitat that hosts lots of endangered species and can absorb water. They store woody debris that flow down the river, create slack water for juvenile fish. This is pretty important because Johnson Creek is one of the only rivers in Portland that still has threatened endangered salmon, and slow moving water is critical for juvenile salmon. They also create nesting habitat for birds and other animals. They recharge and or elevate the water table, and they increase habitat complexity. There are a lot of amazing benefits that beaver dams can bring, but what are some negative ways that beavers affect the land? They can cause flooding, which can cause damage to homes that cost millions. Flooding is also dangerous for humans when roads and other sources are flooded. They can chew through valuable, rare, or important trees, which can oftentimes offset the restoration efforts being made, and felled trees can pose a hazard to utility lines and buildings. But overall, beavers are a great benefit to the ecosystem, and there's a lot of things that are currently impacting them on Johnson Creek. One example is the invasive species called nutria. These are rodents that often compete for the same habitat that the beavers live in. They have rat-like tails and are often a bit smaller in size. Some other impacts is that Johnson Creek is highly urbanized. 
There is constant human influence on the areas that beavers live in, which negatively impact their habitat. Also, a lot of Johnson Creek is channelized, which also decreases the creek's livability. Because of all of these problems, we conduct community science surveys along Johnson Creek to monitor beaver populations. So now we are going to go into what we look for in a beaver survey. So the first sign we are going to talk about is mudslides. It's as cute as it sounds. It's where beavers slide into the water on their bellies. The next sign is lodges. This is where the beaver lives. Most of the time, they are underwater in the back of a dam, the side where the water is pooled up. But sometimes they can be on the side, like in the picture on the bottom right. Next is dams. This is where they have built a wall of logs and branches to block water passage. But be careful to distinguish between a beaver dam and a log or stick jam. Look for other evidence around the dam to be sure. Another sign is bank tunnels. Sometimes there isn't enough room for a lodge, so they would create tunnels into the side of the bank where they sleep instead. A very common sign is beaver chews, where they have chewed away at some type of wood in order to add this to their dam they are building. There's usually a lot of these around. Look for the grooves of their teeth on the wood. Next is canals. Rather than haul wood over things and on land where it's heavier, beavers will create canals to more easily transport the wood. Lastly is scent mounds. These are not as common to find. This is the time of year when two-year-old beavers leave their lodges and strike out on their own, primarily because the woods surrounding a pond usually can't support more than one family of beavers. Beavers are exceptionally territorial. Once they've established a lodge, they do not take kindly to interlopers. In order to make this perfectly clear to house hunting young beavers, in the spring, resident beavers build what are called scent mounds, piles up to three feet in height, but usually much smaller, of mud, leaves, and pond bottom debris around the perimeter of their territory. They then smear castorum, a substance that comes from their castor sacs, over the mound. Chemicals in the castorum convey to roaming young beavers that this particular pond is spoken for. So these are the types of signs we look for when conducting a beaver survey. At the council, we use this data sheet to record all of the beaver signs we find. We take a data point every time we see a major sign such as a lodge or dam, which is in the white. If we find other signs like beaver chews, canals, or anything in the green area near the lodge or dam, then we circle yes or no for presence absence for that data point. Every time you find a dam, you want to give some more details such as the composition, which is either wood, mud, or grass, what those percentages are, if large wood is present, if it's active, which we determine by the color of the wood, typically gray wood means it's inactive, if the dam is intact, so if it's holding water still, and what the water height difference is from behind the dam and in front of it. I will now take you to Arrow Heights, a wetland area near Johnson Creek that has multiple beaver signs so you can see for yourself. Hello students, we're here at Arrow Heights Park located at Southeast 45th and Southeast Harney Drive and we're gonna do a beaver survey. But before we do that, go ahead and take a look at this beautiful area here at Arrow Heights Park. Um, this is a really nice wetland. Um, there's lots of wildlife here, such as ducks. We saw baby geese earlier, hummingbirds, squirrels, all kinds of wildlife that have come here because of the wetland that the beavers have created here. There's a lot of beaver activity here, which is why we're gonna do our survey here today. So before we do our survey, we wanna fill out that top part of the data sheet we saw earlier in the slides. So you want to fill out the date, the name of your surveyors, the reach, which would be Arrow Heights Park for here, um, your start time, and you'll fill out your end time when you're done, and field notes. So field notes can include anything from, um, it's cloudy out today, or maybe the wildlife, like the geese that are yelling at me right now. Um, you could also include the temperature, or anything else you think is relevant, such as if you saw a nutria, the invasive species we mentioned earlier, you would want to put that in your field notes. So we're going to start on our first data point here. So come and take a look. This is our first beaver sign. So go ahead and look at that and see what you think it is based off the signs we mentioned earlier. All right, so this first beaver sign is a dam. So that would be data point A on our, on our data sheet. So now that we know it's a dam, we would actually fill out that extra part of the data sheet, the pink side. So take a look at this dam. Um, our first question is, is what is the dam composition? 
So is it made of wood, mud, or grass, or all three, or maybe just two? So see what you think. So I think this dam is co comprised of wood and mud mostly. There's some weeds on top, but I wouldn't say that this dam is made of grass. So our next question is what percent of those compositions? So how much wood, how much mud? Um, I would say that this dam is about 70% wood and 30% grass, or 30% mud, excuse me. And so, um, yeah, that would be that part. And so our next part is gonna be how much large wood is present? So any wood that has greater than six inches in diameter. So I actually see a couple in the front there. So I would definitely say that this dam has some large wood in it. And then is this dam active? So like I mentioned earlier, is there gray wood, which means it's inactive, or does the wood look pretty fresh? Um, when I take a look at this dam, I would say it's pretty fresh. I don't see a whole lot of gray wood represented, so I would say it's an active dam. Um, our next question is, is the dam active? Is it holding water? Um, is it intact? So I would say yes. If you look at the water level differences here, um, there's definitely a slope going on there. So the dam is holding water. So yes, it is intact. And then usually we would do the approximate water height difference. So we would get in there with a ruler and measure each side of the dam and its water and we subtract the difference to see kind of what the difference in water height is. So those are the questions that we ask ourselves when we find a dam and that is our first data point A. So as we mentioned earlier too, we have that green side of the data sheet which would be included in our data point A. So do we see any other beaver signs around this dam? such as beaver chews or canals or all the other signs we mentioned earlier, which when I was looking earlier, we did find some other beaver signs. So we're gonna come on over here and take a look at the other beaver signs we found. So over on this side, we have another beaver sign. Take a look at what we have here. What do you think this beaver sign is? And then we have an example of the same beaver sign right over here. Take a look at this sign here. It's the same as the one you just saw. What do you think it could be? So, this beaver sign is called beaver chew. You can see the teeth mark that the beavers have left on the wood as they've cut away at it to add to the dam you saw earlier. So for data point A, which we took for that dam, we would also circle yes for beaver chews. They are present around that dam for data point A. So that's the first reach of our uh, beaver survey. So now we're gonna go to the second reach and look at more beaver signs. All right, so now we're at our second reach at Arrow Heights Park and we have a lot of beaver signs in this area. So if you take a look at here, here's our next beaver sign. See what you think it is. So this sign right here is what is called a canal. So this is where they took the wood and they, it was filled with water before and they took the wood so that way it was easier and they didn't have to haul it over land. Um, as you saw in the canal, there's a lot of little footprints in there. Possibly some could be beaver or nutria and there's, um, or other wildlife that use that little track there. And then another beaver sign that we saw earlier right here is this tree. So this is a really big beaver chew. As you can see, they've totally carved out the tree on the sides and they've taken a big notch at the base too. Great, so now we're going to come over here and look at another beaver sign we haven't seen earlier. So here's another beaver sign we haven't seen yet. Take a look at that and see what you think it is. So that beaver sign was a mudslide. So that's where they slid on their bellies a couple times into the water. And so now, during this reach, we're going to pause the video for a minute and we're going to walk upstream just a little bit. All right, we've walked a little further up the stream from those beaver signs, but not too far away. And now we're at our next sign that we've seen earlier. So right here, 
we have another beaver dam. So this would be our data point B, and we would fill out that same pink section as before, but for data point B. So dam composition, the percent of the composition, um, if there's any large wood present, all of those questions we asked before, and that would be data point B. And if you look over there, there's actually another dam. So that would be data point C. And there's multiple dams beyond that. There is a lot of beavers here. So there would be a lot of data points for this area. And then all of those signs that we saw a little earlier on the second reach, we would say yes for those data points. So yes for beaver chews and yes for the um, mudslides and the other, um, the canals that we saw. So we would say yes for those uh, data points here. So now we're gonna move on to the third reach at Arrow Heights. All right, so we're on our last reach here at Arrow Heights and we have one more new beaver sign to look at. So go ahead and take a look right in the middle of the pond area there and see what you think it is. So that beaver sign right there is a beaver lodge. So that is where the beavers are currently sleeping right now. Remember, um, they come out during the night, so they're probably in there right now as we speak. And then, um, of course, we have lots of other beaver signs around this area too. We have a really huge dam right here to the left, um, another dam even farther than that. There's multiple beaver chews, um, sticks lying around. So yeah, a lot more data points to take in this reach. And we're not even that far from the other reaches that we did. Um, so lots of beaver signs here at Arrow Heights. Um, so before we conclude the video segment of this presentation, I just want to quickly mention that you're a com community scientist if you do beaver surveys like this. On the data sheet, there are question marks. So if you're not sure about something, you can circle the question mark. Say you're not sure if a dam is active. You can't tell if the wood is gray or not. That's okay. Just circle the question mark. And each data point has a note section as well. So you can also add notes to say that you're not sure. Um, you are a volunteer that's doing this work, and if you're not sure, it's fine. We will send the pictures that you give us um, to our resident biologist who will, who will either come out here and look for themselves or determine it from the picture. So it's great work that you're doing here with Community Science, and I hope you can get out here to do your own beaver survey. So now that we did the survey, what did we find at Arrow Heights Park? We found numerous beaver signs all along the park. We found mudslides, multiple beaver chews, canals, a large lodge, and plenty of beaver dams. There were beaver signs every few feet in Arrow Heights Park showing that the beaver presence is huge in this area. But what did we not find? We did not find bank tunnels, which is probably due to the fact that there was enough room for a lodge for them to sleep. We did not find scent mounds, but of course I did not go all the way around the park and they are hard to see, so I'm sure there were some there. And of course, we did not see any live beavers. Like I said, beavers come out at night due to human activity during the day. Check out this awesome video taken by one of our volunteers of beaver activity at night at Arrow Heights Park. So there is a lot of beavers at this park. This graph shows the beaver activity in this area that we have collected over four years from our community science program here at the council. The number of dams shoot up in the last two years, and as we saw in this year of 2020, the number of dams is still going strong. But as I mentioned earlier, beavers not only bring benefits, but some negative impacts as well. They had caused flooding near 45th Avenue and have felled numerous trees that have been planted in restoration efforts. In order to combat this in a beaver-friendly way, a beaver deceiver was set up to prevent the flooding shown in the picture on the left. You might have saw it during the first data point we took. This device allows water to flow through the dam, but keep beavers out of the pipe so they don't block the flow. To prevent felled trees, fences were put up around the larger trees shown in the image on the right. This prevents the beavers from chewing on them. But these issues are small in comparison to the benefits they bring. Errol Heights is a beautiful wetland home to numerous species. Just while we were there, I saw a baby geese, a hummingbird, a native wood duck, squirrels, and lots of other critters running around. Here at the council, we want to continue to encourage beaver activity by planting trees and creating suitable habitat. Thank you so much for watching Johnson Creek Watershed Council's beaver video. If you have any videos you would like to see in the future, please email the email provided in the comments. We also provide field trips, which include beaver surveys. See details below. Thank you again, and now please enjoy the next 30 seconds of some beavers chatting with each other.
Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-